Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer Askew, Section Director of the MedStar Colorectal Surgery Program at MedStar Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. I will be presenting this lecture on acute colonic pseudoobstruction. We have no disclosures. At the end of this module, listeners should be able to detail risk factors and diagnostic modalities for identifying acute colonic pseudoobstruction, appreciate the conservative and pharmacologic treatment modalities, discuss endoscopic and surgical options. Acute colonic obstruction, ACPO, is a clinical disorder characterized by severe colonic distension in the absence of mechanical obstruction. It is often referred to by its historic name, Ogilvy syndrome. Patients who develop this condition are often elderly with a mean age of 64 to 74 years. These patients often have multiple chronic conditions and have either been hospitalized recently or are residents of a long-term care facility. ACPO has been associated with a wide variety of conditions, including surgical procedures, systemic lupus erythematosus, hematologic malignancies, cardiopulmonary diseases, and others. We have listed the associated conditions here in table format. Associated conditions are surgical, including coronary bypass, solid organ transplantation, major orthopedic or spine surgery. Cardiac causes include shock, myocardial infarction, and congestive heart failure. Neurologic associated conditions are dementia, Parkinson's disease, stroke, and spinal cord injury. Metabolic abnormalities could include electrolyte imbalances, diabetes, and renal failure. Some of the medications commonly associated are immunosuppressive medications, chemotherapeutic, opiates, anti-Parkinson, and clonidine. Oncologic abnormalities include allogenic stem cell transplantation, pediatric hematologic malignancies, and others. Obstetric-related conditions include cesarean section, normal vaginal delivery, and normal pregnancy. Infectious-related issues could include varicella zoster virus, herpes virus, and cytomegalovirus. Other miscellaneous conditions that are associated include major burn and trauma, systemic lupus erythematosus, and sickle cell disease. The exact pathogenesis of ACPO has not been determined. However, the clinical syndrome is attributed to unopposed parasympathetic activity after the sympathetic supply has been disrupted. The sympathetic innervation to the proximal colon is supplied by the splanchnic nerves, while the vagus nerves supply the parasympathetic input. Recent studies examining gut motility disorders have been focusing on the various neurotransmitters mediating the enteric nervous system. Acetylcholine, neurokinin A, and substance P are the predominant stimulatory neurotransmitters. The predominant inhibitory neurotransmitters are vasoactive intestinal peptide and nitric oxide. In a recent study, sections of colon from stress-conditioned rats showed greater contractility when treated with acetylcholine and greater antagonization when treated with adrenaline when compared to controls. In another study, rats who underwent physiologic stress to model distal colitis had decreased contractility and dilation of the proximal untreated colon, which was reversed by inhibitors of nitric oxide synthase. In studies using guinea pigs, it was found that acetylcholine-mediated contraction is followed by nitric oxide-mediated relaxation in the proximal colon, whereas acetylcholine-stimulated contraction in the middle part of the colon without relaxation. These studies suggest that a mechanism for sequel dilation often seen in ACPO caused by acetylcholine stimulation leads to transient contraction 
followed by nitric oxide decreased contractility and dilation of the proximal colon. The dilation seen in ACPO is often proximal to the splenic flexure. Patients with ACPO are often elderly patients with multiple medical conditions and have typically undergone abdominal or non-abdominal surgery, particularly orthopedic surgeries. Patients will present with abdominal pain, distension, nausea, and vomiting. Patients may have an inability to pass flatus and stools. However, this is not always the case. Some patients may present with diarrhea. Abdominal auscultation often reveals high-pitched tinkling bowel sounds or absent bowel sounds. The diagnosis of ACPO is one of exclusion. It is extremely important to rule out mechanical obstructions using abdominal x-rays and CT scan with oral, IV, and rectal contrast. Caution should be taken when giving rectal contrast as there is an increased risk of perforation in the setting of extreme colonic dilation. Due to the risk of perforation, a water-soluble agent such as gastrographin should be used instead of barium in case a leak or perforation occurs. Abdominal x-ray series may be useful in identifying an obstructive pattern while helping to rule out anatomic causes of obstruction, such as volvulus or obstructing mass. In addition, an x-ray can show perforations. From the x-ray, a cecal diameter should be measured. A cecal dilation of 9 to 12 centimeters is concerning for impending perforation. Lab tests are often nonspecific and not diagnostic. However, an elevated white blood count, lactate, or C-reactive protein are concerning for perforation or ischemic bowel. Also, electrolyte imbalances may occur and should be corrected when identified. A diagnostic colonoscopy is not recommended and is not helpful in an unprepped bowel. This is an abdominal x-ray of an elderly woman admitted to the hospital for abdominal distension. This image shows that the distension is pancolonic and extends to the rectum suggestive of ACPO. This is another patient with similar radiographic findings. This abdominal x-ray, on the other hand, is of an elderly woman admitted to the hospital for abdominal distension. This image shows paucity of air in the sigmoid or rectum, suggesting mechanical large bowel obstruction rather than ACPO. ACPO is initially treated with medical management and often has good success. However, if that fails, the procedurally based endoscopic therapy, followed by surgery, may be needed for these patients. I will begin discussing the medical therapies used to treat ACPO. Patients that are stable with no peritoneal signs and a cecal diameter less than 12 centimeters on x-ray should undergo medical therapy. Medical management includes correcting electrolyte abnormalities, discontinuing opiates, NG tube decompression, correcting fluid imbalances, discontinuing antimotility agents, and discontinuing oral intake. In addition, increasing mobility of the patient if possible. As long as the patient remains stable, these measures should be continued for 48 to 72 hours. This treatment approach is associated with an overall mortality rate of 14% and a success rate as high as 70%. If the previous management options do not work, the next step in a stable patient is to try a pharmacologic intervention with neostigmine. Neostigmine is a parasympathomimetic that inhibits acetylcholinesterase. This leads to increased availability of acetylcholine and direct parasympathetic stimulation by nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. 
The increased acetylcholine results in high amplitude colonic peristalsis and subsequent flatus and or bowel movements. Due to the increased parasympathetic stimulation, patients may experience profound bradycardia and should have a baseline EKG done before starting neostigmine. Patients may also experience abdominal discomfort, emesis, and excessive salivation. In a double-blinded study, neostigmine provided a 91% initial clinical response when compared to the placebo. If there is no initial response in the first three hours, neostigmine, two milligrams, can be repeated every three hours for up to a total of three doses. Once ACPO has resolved, it's recommended that patients start polyethylene glycol solution to help prevent recurrence. A double-blinded study showed that recurrences did not occur in patients using polyethylene glycol, whereas 33% of patients in the placebo arm of the trial experienced recurrence. If patients fail pharmacologic therapy, the next step in treatment is endoscopic therapy. This involves endoscopic colonic decompression in conjunction with placement of a non-traumatic large diameter soft catheter rectal tube. Another option is sustained decompression with placement of a long catheter into the cecum under fluoroscopic guidance or endoscopic piggyback. It has been suggested that colonic decompression is associated with an initial success rate of 69% and a recurrence rate of 40% when concurrent tube decompression wasn't performed. Colonoscopic decompression has been associated with a morbidity and mortality rate of 1.7% and 3.4% respectively. If medical management, pharmacologic, and endoscopic treatments fail, then surgery may be required. Surgery may also be required in patients who deteriorate clinically, present with peritonitis, or have a sequel diameter of 12 centimeters or greater. Operative therapies include ileostomy, colostomy, bowel resection, exteriorization, cecostomy tube placement, intraoperative long tube placement, and others. The operative treatments with the highest success rates and lowest morbidity rates are resections or exteriorization or cecostomy and are the current treatment choice when surgery is necessary. The mortality rate associated with surgery for ACPO is 30 to 44% and approaches the higher end of that spectrum in older patients or in those with ischemic or perforated bowel. We thought it may be helpful to describe the procedural steps of fluoroscopic catheterization in case listeners are unfamiliar with how to set this up. This was described well by Herrig et al. and Mesmer et al. Procedural steps of fluoroscopic catheterization include, first, colonoscopy with minimal to no insufflation, suctioning the distension until the cecum is reached. Number two, placement of a guide wire through the biopsy channel of the colonoscope. Number three, removal of the colonoscope while leaving the guide wire in place. Number four, under fluoroscopic guidance, a catheter can be threaded over the guide wire into the cecum. And number five, it is secured with tape or suture to the inner thigh of the patient. In cases where fluoroscopy is not available, Stevenson et al. have described the piggyback technique with the following procedural steps. The procedural steps of the piggyback technique are first use a two-channel colonoscope one that allows for both suction and insufflation. Number two, fill the biopsy channel of the colonoscope with biopsy forceps and pass the forceps through the channel. Number three, place silk sutures through the holes at the tip of any appropriate suction tube. Number four, grasp the silk sutures with the biopsy forceps and pull the suture partially into the biopsy channel of the colonoscope. The tube will trail behind the tip of the colonoscope. Number five, insert the colonoscope into the anus and advance as far as possible. Number six, advance the biopsy forceps beyond the tip of the colonoscope and release the silk. Number seven, confirm placement of the tube with x-ray. And finally, 
place the tube to low intermittent suction. Percutaneous secostomy tube placement is performed under ultrasound and fluoroscopic guidance. When patients require it, it has a success rate of up to 100%. Morbidity and mortality rates associated with tube secostomy are 50% and 19% respectively. This treatment option is associated with complications including pressure necrosis, granulation tissue formation, cellulitis of the abdominal wall, ventral hernia, persistent colocutaneous fistula, tube occlusion, and sepsis. As described by Nishiwaki et al., percutaneous secostomy tube placement under ultrasound and fluoroscopic guidance involves these steps. The procedural steps of tube secostomy are, number one, under ultrasound guidance, anchor the anterior wall of the cecum to the abdominal wall at three points with fixation devices. Number two, puncture the cecum with a 16 gauge needle, insert a guide wire through the outer sheath, and use the Seldinger technique under fluoroscopic guidance to dilate the cecocutaneous fistula up to 24 French. Number three, percutaneously place a 24 French secostomy tube in the cecum. Then obtain post-procedural films. And finally, administer cefepirazone IM or IV for three days as a prophylactic antibiotic. There is not much information about the prevention of ACPO, and most guidelines suggest similar preventative techniques as those used to prevent ileus and constipation. This includes limiting opiate use, early ambulation, laxative use in the setting of narcotic use, and correcting fluid and electrolyte imbalances. To date, there have not been any randomized controlled trials looking at preventive techniques for ACPO. It is important to be aware of this disorder as it is a potentially morbid and fatal condition in chronically ill elderly patients and has the potential to be treated successfully when caught early. To summarize, we have provided a treatment algorithm providers can consider when approaching a patient with signs and symptoms concerning for ACPO. The treatment algorithm first includes radiographically assuring that the patient has a non-mechanical bowel obstruction. Obtain and review a CT scan if available and review prior colonoscopies if available. Then begin conservative measures. Correct electrolyte and fluid balance. Stop all opiates. Stop all constipating anti-motility medications. Use NG tube decompression and encourage ambulation. Next, conservative measures may be continued for up to 72 hours if the cecal diameter is less than 12 centimeters and there are no peritoneal signs. If conservative treatment fails, we then use neostigmine in cardiac monitored setting, but you should have atropine available. The dose is two milligrams IV over two to five minutes. If the patient still does not improve, colonic decompression with or without the placement of a rectal tube is performed. Finally, surgical placement of a secostomy tube versus a subtotal colectomy may be performed. I'd like to thank MedStar Colorectal Surgery Program as well as a few individuals who contributed content for this presentation and whose names are listed here. Thank you for your attention.